Does God love sinners? It's a fair question. A lot of people try to say that, uh, well, God loves the sinner and hates the sin, and God loves people and stuff like this. Well, we're going to see about what the Bible has to say about that today. Uh, this is an old uh, sermon that I had done seven years ago, um, October 31st, actually, in 2010. It's now October, I'm not even sure what it is, 7th or 8th or something like that, 2017. So, um, as I'm recording this. So we're going to look about what the scriptures have to say, not what our feelings or emotions uh, want us to believe. And um, this is going to be the very first sermon recorded at our new property. If you've been following the ministry, if you're a friend of the ministry, um, we're here on our new property. Uh, so very, very good to be here after a long time of prayer and, uh, and just seeing where the Lord wants us to be. So here we are. It's autumn time, leaves changing, it's very beautiful. So, uh, happy to be here. Thank you to everybody who was praying for us to get to this point in our lives. So, that's a little bit of an intro there. There, um, This is going to be a two-part message. Again, I'm reading from my old notes here. Um, part number one of this is, who is God's love for? Part number two is going to be, who is God's wrath and hatred for? Yes, God does hate certain types of people, certain types of... Uh, in situations there. We're going to see about what the scriptures say. Okay? Now, question number one, as we get into this thing of who is God's love for. Question number one, the term God loves you. That exact phrase, God loves you. How many times does that appear in the King James Bible? Zero. Never. Never does the term God loves you appear in the King James Bible. How about God loves you? sinners. How many times in the King James Bible? Zero. Those two phrases are not in the Bible, so they shouldn't be part of your vocabulary. Psalm 45 verse 1 says, To the chief musician upon Shoshanim, for the sons of Korah, Mashiel, a song of loves. My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Okay, so there you have the word loves. Okay, actually the word loves appears three times in your King James Bible. We're going to read all three of these. Um, the next one would be Proverbs 7.18. Come let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. The harlot there. The woman who is basically a whore. And uh, she's the second one that says loves. Again, God is not, you know, anywhere in the Bible, never where does it say God loves sinners. L-O-V-E-S, I'm talking about. Hopefully you can hear me today. It's a little bit breezy out here. Uh, shouldn't be too big of a problem, but keep going here. The third reference to loves in the King James Bible is Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 12, that says, Let us get up early to the vineyards. Let us see in the vine flourish, if the vine flourish, whether the tender grape appear and the pomegranates bud forth. There will I give thee my loves. Okay? Very interesting there. So, um, the Bible never says that God loves a sinner. That is a man-made phrase, and I'm going to show you. It's not just, well, man made it, but it's backed up by Scripture. Maybe not the exact wording, but it's there. No, that's not true. You see, the fact of the matter is, God loved, you take away the S, you put a D there, God loved the sinner at Calvary. Loved is a past tense word. It's not present tense. And we're going to see about that as we go through this. Okay? This uh, thing of God loves the sinner, a neat little way that you can remember this is that uh, the S, when you put the S there, you replace the D for the S. The S is also, you know, begins the name Satan. Satan is the one that wants people to think that God loves you and your sin. He doesn't. I'm going to tell you that right now. You say, what about John 3, 16? For God so loved the world. He did what? Loved the world. There's a D there. Let's look about that. John 3, 16. The favorite memory verse of lost people. They'll try to make it, you know, God loved the world, so therefore he loves me where I'm at right now, and I don't have to repent. Uh, you couldn't be more wrong. John chapter 3, verse 16. It says here, for God so loved 
the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Calvary is a past event, and it happened one time. It's not like the Roman Catholic Mass, Eucharist thing, that, that teaches that it happens over and over and over again. Christ's sacrifice is a continual thing that just goes on perpetually. No, that's not true. Jesus Christ died once for sin. He isn't dying perpetually over and over and over again. And if you want God's love, it was manifest back there at the cross. Well, Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins. That's when God's love was manifest right there. Romans chapter 5. Turn next in your King James Bible to Romans chapter 5. And you need to be turning in, in your Bible too, by the way. I say it, you know, and a lot of people are just so used to hearing turn in your Bible, and then they don't turn in their Bible. Uh, you need to, the, the, the whole part of being a, uh, or the whole thought of being a Bible-believing Christian is the Bible is your standard. And you want to make sure that some guy that's standing in front of a camera or standing up behind a pulpit someplace, no basis in Scripture for that, but some guy that's up there and he's telling you what God thinks or what this or what that, you need to be checking him in the Scriptures, seeing if these things are so. Make sure he's not lying to you. That's very important. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You say, well, there it says love. It doesn't have the love, duh. Yeah, but it's still a past tense verse. Read it. God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Past tense event. He died on the cross while you're a sinner. You see? It's not you got to do a whole bunch of good things and be a really good person and then get saved. You know? That's a lot of people have this, this mindset, you know, that, that I'm a good person. And think, Well, then who did Jesus die for? If you don't need Jesus' death on the cross to pay for your sins, then who needs it? Do you ever think about that? Somebody really, really rotten? You're good, so you don't really need it? doesn't work that way. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. See, there's, there's scriptures that people are going to try to turn to you to to say, well, see, see how, much God, how much God loves you? But you actually look at the scripture and you go, wait a second, it's not love's present tense. It's a past tense event. Something that happened in the past. Not one time in your King James Bible does it ever say that God, present tense, loves a sinner? It's not there. 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Are you a sinner? He came for sinners. You say, oh, I'm not a bad person. Then he didn't come for you. Jesus Christ didn't die for you unless you're a sinner. Unless you can get through that wall of self-righteous pride that you have, you're never going to make it to heaven. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. Well, then trust your own self-righteousness. But for those of us who can say, yeah, I'm a sinner, then Jesus Christ died for people like me. And he died for people like you, if you're a sinner. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, verses uh, 3 through 7. It says here, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, past tense, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Okay? 
Are you ready to get saved? You see how the thing works? If you're a sinner and you've messed up your life, like it says there in verse 3, we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Disobedient. Do you obey God? Is that something that you even think about? Do you even wake up in the morning and think about obeying God? The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Deceived. Have you ever been deceived? Have you ever been lied to? Everybody has. I have. You have. Don't tell me that you've never been deceived by anybody. Yes, you have. And you've done some deceiving on your own, haven't you? You get a little bit scared and you start lying to people. Oh, yeah. Serving divers' lusts and pleasures. Divers means many, essentially, in your King James Bible. Have you ever uh, tried to serve all different types of pleasures and lusts? Watch dirty movies? Go out, get drunk, party, whatever. Lusts and pleasures. Buy all kinds of new stuff. Go a little shopping spree or whatever else. Yeah, you have. Does it make you happy? For a little bit of time. But after a while, that new starts to wear off, you know, or you start to get the hangover or whatever else. Yeah. Living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. I find that so funny. All the people that talk about diversity and, and we need to stop, you know, being intolerant and bigoted and everything else, they're the most narrow-minded, bigoted people out there. And you know it. They want to put other people in jail that disagree with them. A lot of the people that call themselves liberal today, leftist liberals and things like that, they're some of the most hateful, bigoted people out there. Want to imprison you, want to shut down channels like mine because I speak against certain things that they like. What's the problem? They're hateful. You say, what about the conservative right wing? Oh, absolutely, they're hateful too. So you can live in your little opium pipe dream and say, you know what, I think that we're going to have a time when everybody's going to get together. And we're all going to get along and we're all going to... You're crazy. You're kidding yourself. I mean, I've said this thing before in other studies. Do you get along with every member of your family? I don't know too many families that everybody gets along with each other. How are you going to get along with uh, your neighbor? People across the world. The whole world's going to get together. Ha! <laughs> I don't think so. Say, so, well, then where do we find true love? Oh, uh, I don't know. In a book... They wrote about uh, our Creator that loved you enough to send His own Son to die in your place because of how wicked you are. Well, I'm not a bad person. I'm not a bad person. I think God loves me as I am. You're deceiving yourself. You've been lied to. Well, I know a preacher. Yeah, that preacher's after your money. I'm not. 1 John chapter 4. Here's the infamous, what a lot of people call the love chapter. We know that uh, John was the disciple whom Jesus loved. So if you want to hear about some love, how God loves and things like that, you probably ought to read 1 John. Something from John. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 21. I'm going to read the, uh, yeah, the entire chapter here. Because this is one I've heard modern professing Christians all say, well, there's love there. There's love, you know, God loves you there and stuff. Well, let's, let's see about that. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. If you have an NIV, they change it to has come in the flesh. It's not present tense. There Jesus is dead. He's just no more. He's just another God, you see. King James says, is come in the flesh, because Jesus still is alive. So they fail the you know, test of number two there, verse two. Um, verse three, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us, he that is not of God heareth not us. 
Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. It almost sounds like they're judging there. Like John is telling us that we can judge people. Giving us a, a test to try the spirits, whether they're of God. Yeah, that's exactly it. You know, again, people have this funny notion that a Christian is supposed to have love by basically being very vague and ambiguous about what they believe. Well, I believe that I'm going to go to heaven, but for you, I can't tell one way or the other. And honestly, I can't really say for sure. And how is that love? How is that being anything? If I'm a preacher of the gospel, I need to be able to tell you how to get to heaven. And I need to be able to say and have some standards and say, yeah, that guy isn't saved. Adolf Hitler was a professing Christian. So according to some people, I guess I shouldn't judge him because I don't know where his relationship was at with the Lord. That's nonsense. I can look at what he did. I can look at the fruits of the man and say he wasn't a Christian. You see? Some dirty Catholic priest and he's raping children. And you say, but he's a, he's a priest. He's, a, he's, he's part of the church and things like that. He's raping children. He can't be saved. Try the spirits. Somebody comes along and says, I'm a Christian. Okay, I've got to ask you some questions. Especially nowadays. You know, Christian can mean anything nowadays. It's sickening. Verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Sure. You know, and I just got to say this before I continue. A lot of people think that love means uh, some kind of tolerance for everybody else's sin and, and just non-judgmental. That's not love. That's not love. I have a little boy, my son, if I see him walk in some place and some hornet is going to sting him, gets on his back, I'm going to go swat the hornet. I'm not going to be concerned about both of their feelings. And, well, I probably shouldn't intervene there and I shouldn't judge the hornet as it's stinging my son or something. It's not love. If I love my son, I'm going to kill the hornet. Love my son, hate the hornet. You see how that works? My son gets sick. What I want to do? I want to kill the bacteria or the virus that's made my son sick. That's what I'm going to do if I love him. If I don't love him, well, let's just be tolerant. You know, I, I, son, you're going to have to get to know the, the, the virus and overlook its, its uh, things, at bad negative points, and you were just, you know, mentally ill, if you believe that way. True love requires true hatred. Verse 8, 1 John chapter 5, verse 8. Excuse me, chapter 4, verse 8. Excuse me. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Hmm. Notice the past tense again here in, this, in these verses. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved, past tense, us, and sent, past tense, his son, to be the propitiation for our sins. Why do people reject that? It's always been a mystery to me. How amazing this, this gift of love from God is. And yet they reject it. I think I'll work my own way out. You know, I, I don't really think I need that. And I, I think I'm going to be okay. I think God loves me. Weird. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Who's he talking about? Talking about saved people. You say, well, then you don't, you don't have to love uh, lost people? Oh, no, I love them too. I love people. You say, well, as sarcastic as you are? Yes. You see, I'm trying to warn you. If I believe what this book says, I'm going to speak plainly and I'm going to speak bluntly and I'm not going to beat around the bush. I'm going to tell you exactly what this book says. I'm not going to sugarcoat things so I don't risk offending you. If you're in a river, asleep in your canoe, and you're heading for a waterfall, I'm not going to speak in soft tones from you as I'm standing on the bank. I'm going to scream and yell at you. Why? Because I love you. That's why. I want to tell you about the love of God. The love that was manifest in the past on the cross. To pay for your sins. And you better be careful, Christian. If you get into an uncomfortable situation and you 
get in an argument with somebody and as they walk off, you say, well, just remember, God loves you. You're lying. Don't you dare say that. The Bible doesn't say that. The never, Bible never said that. You say, hey, just remember God loved you. He loved you enough to send His Son to die in your place. That's what you can say. Continuing. Verse 12, No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed that lo the love that God hath to us, God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Very true. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. See the past tense again. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Absolutely. You love people when you warn them about God's judgment that's coming. Because you see, it's not just, oh, God's so mean and he's condemning and everything else. God would be mean if he provided no way of salvation. God would be a horrible, cruel unrighteous God if he said I, I designed people for hell like hyper Calvinism teaches. Hyper Calvinism is a system John Calvin came up with uh, centuries ago and I think it was you know 16th century sometime in there but um, it, was this, it was a system that, that this man came up with this former Catholic quote unquote and he came up with this thing saying that God has chosen certain people as elect and other people as non-elect and if you are non-elect there's nothing that you can do to become one of the elect. So God has designed a whole lot of people and they can't get saved. He gives them life and they can never get saved. They can never become a Christian. Well, that's nonsense when you read the Bible. You'll see that God so loved the world that whosoever believeth. <laughs> Not whosoever of the elect. Doesn't even make any sense. Well, let's continue. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Okay? You love God, then you love Jesus Christ. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Okay? Yeah. We're supposed to love the Lord. We're supposed to love his word and his commandments. But you can't say, like the Jews do today, I love God, but I don't love Jesus Christ. It doesn't work. That's the reason for the time of Jacob's trouble that's coming very soon. The Jews are going to find out very soon that Jesus Christ is God Almighty, and that He is their Messiah that they rejected. They're going to find that out. The time of Jacob's trouble is about the purification of the Jewish people, not the church. The church is not going to be here. That's why these uh, post-tribbers always have to change it. They can't call it Daniel's 70th week because you can look up in Daniel chapter 9 and it talks about, you know, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, Israel. They can't call it the time of Jacob's trouble because Jacob is another name for Israel. So the posties have to come along and say it's called the tribulation or the great tribulation, which term appears not one time as a title for this coming seven-year period. Not once. But you see, the posties have to change it because they want you to think it's about the church being purified and not the Jews. And then they have the audacity to come and say, people like me that support the nation of Israel being in their land, and they say, you're saying that they don't have to be saved. I've never once said that. Never once. Any Jew, any Jew that rejects Jesus Christ as their Messiah today goes to hell when they die. Any of them. You say, God's chosen people? God's chosen people. 
seed of Abraham, physical seed of Abraham, physical seed of Abraham, burning in hell for rejecting Jesus Christ. That's why when Jesus Christ shows up, they're weeping and, and crying and things. You read about that back in the Old Testament when the Messiah shows up. Let's continue. God's love for saved sinners. Let's keep looking at some of these verses. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Verses 35 through 39. Let's read these verses. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Well, if you're a postie, then uh, yeah, those things will. Because they try to say it's the time period that's coming is the tribulation. And they say that you can be separated. Turning Paul's words into a lie. It's kind of interesting why they would do that. Uh, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, you understand that the church has gone before the time of Jacob's trouble even gets started, falsely called the Great Tribulation, but, you know, whatever. And you understand that this verse is true. Interesting. Verse 36. As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Loved us. You say it again? For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you have Christ Jesus as your Lord? Is He your Lord and Savior? You say, well, no, I, I just have, then you don't have God's love. Do you understand that? God loved you enough to send Jesus Christ to be your Savior. You see? So simple. But I got to say something. What a lot of these modern churches are doing is they'll quote verses of Scripture like we just read there in Romans chapter 8, and you'll see them on their church signs outside, you know. Uh, God loves you and all this other stuff, and they'll, they'll, you know, we're more than conquerors through Him that loved us. They'll take verses where the Lord is addressing Christians and they'll apply it to just general populace. Anybody out there, Christ rejecting sinners, have God's love on them. You know why they're doing that? Because they're after your money. I, you know, and I'm, I'm not joking. I mean, modern church buildings, and understand if you're new to this ministry, there are no church buildings in the entire New Testament. Not one. Okay? Not one time are you going to see a church referring to a building. It's always a group of people. This whole church building thing comes from Roman Catholicism. They took the pagan temples and sanctified them and made them Christian and took pagan idols and gave them Bible names. So Semiramis or uh, you know, Diana, these pagan you know, deities, these women, female pagan goddesses, became Mary, you know, truth. And a lot of these saints, they're just, you know, Mercury or, or, you know, some of these other Greek gods and things like that. Roman gods and things. Yeah. Another point. But what I'm trying to say is these church buildings, uh, if you go to them, they're going to mess you up. Just as simple as that. And they will lie to you about, they'll take verses that are for saved Christians and apply them to you if you're lost. Try to make you think that God loves you. God doesn't love you if you're lost. He loved you. Enough to send His Son to die on the cross in your place. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. It says here, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, Neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Talking about saved people. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Again, God's love is there for saved people. And he reveals it to you, to you as a Christian. The more you get to know the Lord and stuff like that, and you realize he does things for you, and he takes care of things, and he just takes care of you, and... You'll be shocked at how many times the Lord will save you from 
all kinds of health problems, accidents, and, and financial things, and whatever else. God will answer your prayers. It's amazing. But you don't have those promises if you're lost. You need to get saved. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Not you and the lost. Just save people. Greet one another with an holy kiss. All the saints salute you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. God's love for saved people, not for lost. You better get a hold of that. Now let's look at the second part of this study. God's wrath and hatred. Say hatred? Hate? Hate? You know? I mean, again, think about this whole modern thing of hate is just, you say hate and people go, oh, like some kind of weird, like, oh, it's some evil thing to even say the word hate. You know? And I, I love to say to these people, I say, do you hate hate crimes? You know? Crazy. But does the Bible actually teach that God hates anything? God's wrath and hatred. Let's go back to John chapter 3. You know, we read John chapter 3, verse 16 earlier. Let's, uh, let's go back. Let's, see some, let's read some verses after John 3, 16. John chapter 3. Verses 18 through 20. Okay, it says here, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You're condemned when you hear the gospel the first time, and you say, ah, no, I don't know. You're condemned. You're on your way to hell. It isn't a lifetime of wickedness and rejection of Jesus Christ and whatever else uh, that earns you hell. It's the first time that you hear the gospel clearly presented to you and you reject it. You are under God's condemnation. You can still get saved. You can still repent. But you're under God's condemnation. You need to think about that. Verse 19, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Yeah. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. I saw an article here uh, just recently over in, in uh, England, I think in London actually, I think it was, and um, there was a guy on a public train, and a uh, Christian, Bible believer, from what I was able to ascertain from the article. And, um, and he stood up and he said, I'd like to talk to you people about Jesus Christ and how he died for your sins. And, and, and you know, he started to try to just give a little witness, something that was very common years ago. And this article said people screamed, and literally it was at, it was at a train stop. People literally screamed, ran over, and pried the doors open and were jumping out of the train down onto the tracks. And the, you know, the, the police, I guess, had to come and they had to say, they had to stop and say, don't, don't, don't step on the tracks. If you touch both tracks, you'll get electrocuted, you know? And they're, what's going on? And people were like, he's trying to kill us. He's trying to kill us. He said he was going to murder us and everything. And there were a few people that had some common sense on the train and they were saying, he didn't say anything about killing us. He was just talking about Jesus and the Bible. But see, it's gotten so bad that people think that anyone that, that is going to judge their life is just this hateful, evil, terroristic, suicide bomber or something ridiculous like that. It's ridiculous. Why? People don't want to come to the light. They love darkness rather than light. That's the whole truth of the matter. It's pretty bad. Now let's talk about the wrath of God. Turn to Romans chapter 1. See, if it was just love, if that's all it was, just this, this message of love, where God loves you just as you are, 
He just loves everything about you like a, like a nice, gentle father. He looks down at you as you're watching your porn or getting drunk or fornicating or sodomite or, or some guy dressing like a woman or some woman dressing like a guy. And whatever other things you do, God looks, just looks down and just goes, Oh, I love you. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> but if that's what it was, who would be offended? Nobody. Why would Jesus come to the earth to die on the cross if that's how God felt? Let's look about the wrath of God. We're going to see exactly how God feels. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. All this, all this beauty out here, and yet there are people that say, this all happened as a random accident billions of years ago. This is the result of it happening, and then slow, gradual evolution got us to this complexity. Why? Because they don't want their sins judged. And it cracks me up so much. I've been in so many debates with these atheists, and they will just get so irate and emotional, get so angry. Why? They'll say, your book is a book of fairy tales. What are you getting upset about it for then? If you're truly an atheist, if you truly believe in science, science is your standard, science is rational, it's logical. There's no emotion in science. I mean, what's the last time you saw some scientist and he's going around, I'll just do it this way, you know, he looks at this weed and he goes, this is a piece of goldenrod. How dare you? What is that? Why would you interject emotion into something saying, what is this plant here? Let's scientifically analyze this. Well, let's look at the leaf structure in here and, and let's, let's see here. If evolution, atheistic evolution, if it's just purely based on science, then there would be no emotion tied in with it. But the very fact that these people are extremely emotional, they get very irritated when somebody like me calls them a sinner on their way to hell, that proves that atheism Evolution, evolution uh, <clears throat> excuse me, evolutionary atheism, I'll get it out yet, that proves that it's a religion. It's another one of the man-made religions of self-righteousness that seeks to do away with the scriptures. It's exactly what it is. Go on to the next verse here. Romans chapter 2, verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render, render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. When you seek for it, where do you look for those things there? Glory, honor, immortality, eternal life. Who's the author of eternal life? The Lord Jesus Christ. When you seek for salvation, in other words, you're going to go to the cross and nowhere else. You gave up on yourself a long time ago. Verse 8, But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Hmm. Oh, God loves you, you know. I mean, if you reject Jesus Christ, just remember, God loves you. <laughs> no, he doesn't. And Christian, you're going to answer. The Bible says every word, idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment, whether it be good or evil. And it is an evil, evil thing for a Christian to go to a lost person and tell them that God loves you. Take away the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When they start to fear God and they start to say, you know what? I don't know where I'm going to go when I die. And you come along and you get cowardly and just say to them, well, okay, you know, it's uncomfortable. So I'm just going to say, well, God loves you. There's a good chance you just damn them to hell. Because you'll take that conviction away. Hey, you're going to go to hell. 
How's that make you feel if you're lost? It's either gonna make you angry or it's gonna make you scared. Yeah, but what happens if I follow that up with saying, but, but, God loves you. All of a sudden, the conviction, all of a sudden, the fear melts away and you say, well, if God loves me, then I guess I can continue doing what I'm doing and he'll love me for it. It's a terrible, terrible thing when a Christian tells a lost person that God loves them. It's okay to tell them God loved you enough to send his son to die in your place. But again, that's offensive to people. I mean, it's, it's saying you're not good enough. Anything that you do is never going to please God. Whatever you do, the best that you can do is going to land you in hell. God had to send his son to die in your place. How offensive. But it's the truth. And I'll tell you right now, another thing, and that is all the stuff that's going on in the world right now, and you see all the people suffering and all this death and destruction and all the other things like that. You say, why would a loving God do that? Because the world has rejected Jesus Christ. That's why. You see these countries that are totally heathen, that they could care less about the Bible. And don't give me this, oh, well, they've never heard. Listen, listen. They have their conscience. They can look at this world and they can say, you know what? This world has to have had a creator. But I've been to those countries, some of those countries, where third world countries and stuff like that, where the people have no use for God. You know what? They live just like animals do. They don't want people coming and saying, hey, you better quit that fornicating. You better quit that, these men. I knew, I knew a situation in Honduras where one man had 50 children. I think it was over 50 children or something like that in his life. To how many different women? Yeah. Yeah. And you go through this little village where I stayed years and years ago. You go through this little village and it's like, that guy's this bro guy's brother. There's like the whole village is like all related because of this one fornicating man years and years ago. As far as I know, he died and went to hell. Oh, but the poor innocent guy, he never had, you know, a preacher and a, and a Bible and stuff like this. You get into that kind of wickedness, you're showing by your life that you've rejected God's standards. So don't tell me, oh, what about the innocent people, the innocent heathen in other countries that have never heard the gospel? Don't even talk to me about it. God will judge those people by their acceptance or rejection of His revelation through nature. Those people get evolutionistic and they say, oh, I don't believe that there is a God. I don't believe I'm accountable to anything like this. They're searing their conscience. But you get somebody in that country, in one of those types of countries, that says, there's got to be a God. I wish I could know the truth. God will get the gospel to them. Some way, somehow, He'll get them the truth. Nobody innocent has ever gone to hell. Everybody that ends up in hell deserves to be there. And you look out at this world and you see all this death and destruction and carnage and everything else, it's God's wrath. Don't even tell me God's up there and he all of a sudden, you know, he turns on the news in the morning and he goes, oh no, oh, hundreds of people died in that earthquake. I didn't even know about that. You know? And yet, you say, well, yeah, brother Brian, this is, this is kind of insulting. Of course we know that, do you? Do you really know that as a Christian? Why do you feel bad when you see that kind of thing happening? Wicked countries, wicked areas and stuff like this that have rejected Jesus Christ, don't want anything to do with Jesus Christ, and God says, boom, axe falls, it's trapped under a building, and you say, where can I send my check to? Excuse me? It's a weird situation. I mean, it's a good thing that Christians aren't going to be in the time of Jacob's trouble because Christians would probably going out and be trying to help people fix up their homes after God just destroyed them in his plagues. It's a weird system. Ephesians chapter 5. I mean, you get this country, this, this world, and they just chance after chance after chance after chance to get right with God. Nope, nope, no, no, no. 
Because God loves us. I won't perpetuate that. If these narrow-minded bigots try to take down my channel eventually, I mean, they've been cutting down the views for years and years now. I know that. I mean, I, I remember the one time I saw 80,000 views disappear in one night. Uh, for some reason, I looked at it the night before. The next day, I woke up and I'm like, whoa, wait a second. 80,000 views deleted from my channel. They've been doing this thing for years. I got people writing me and stuff all over the country, all over the world. And they're all saying, Brother Brown, I can't even find your videos half the time. Being removed from feeds and stuff like this. Yeah, mm -hmm, I know about it. You uh, tolerant people that believe in diversity at Google and whatever else. If you ever want to take down my channel, you know, uh, it's not going to be because, uh, you know, I was openly hateful of anybody. But I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to compromise the truth. It's not going to happen. I don't care what it costs me. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 5 through 7. Let's see more, a little bit about the wrath of God here. For this ye know, that no whoremonger nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, Hmm. We're not to be partakers with them. Um, what do you think God thinks of Christians that uh, start to go along with the world's sympathies when they see God's judgment fall on a country? Just this morning before we came here, I uh, did a video, a short video about Germany. In Germany, they got these two d disgusting men. I was just like, it just goes through me. I see two men kissing each other on the lips. It's, it's foul. It's an abomination in God's sight. Okay, and it's a sick, sad thing, by the way, as well. Uh, they don't even give me this thing that sodomites are happy and they just, oh, they can experience love that a man and a wife can. That is a total lie. I don't believe that for one second. I know people that are saved, they're former sodomites, they weren't happy. You know, not at all. It's a terrible life, absolutely terrible life. But these two guys, you know, and they're, oh, they're so happy and we're so proud now that we're so progressive, we can now get married and things like this here in Germany. Four days after that first gay marriage in Germany, four days later, God sends a hurricane, or I should say a tropical storm, and slams into Germany. Seven people dead. You know, and I don't know how much damage and whatever else. I just heard about it this morning. Now, as a Christian, how do you feel about that? If you say, uh, well, that's a shame. Isn't that so sad? Boy, I sure do feel bad about the people in Berlin that have had to suffer this terrible... You know what you're doing? You're becoming a partaker with the lost world. You're looking at the judgment, the righteous, holy judgment of God and saying, oh, that's, that's a shame that he had to do that. God loves people after all. God loves sinners. It's a serious thing, brethren. We're called to stand for truth. Truth makes you unpopular. Continuing, Colossians chapter 3. Verses 5 through 7. It says here, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. Again, very similar to what we just read over in Ephesians chapter 5. Very interesting. Turn to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 14. Verses, verse 10 here. So you know what, I'm just going to read these verses here real, quick, real quickly. We'll just go through them fast for sake of time. I want to get through this. 
Uh, Revelation 14, verse 10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and of, in, in the presence of the Lamb. The wrath of God comes on you if you take the mark of the beast in that time of Jacob's trouble. And in that time, you take that mark, you worship the beast and his image, you're done, you're finished. There is no forgiveness in that time period. Revelation 14, verse 19. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered, gathered the wine of the earth and cast it in the great winepress of the wrath of God. See it again there. Revelation 15, verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Revelation 15, verse 7. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. Revelation chapter 16, verse 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple, saying to the seven angels, Go your ways, and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Revelation 16, verse 19. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. This pouring, this time that's coming, the time of Jacob's trouble, is going to be the greatest pouring out of God's wrath ever. And you do have a chance to escape it, and that is by salvation. Body Christ is going to be leaving before this time comes. But finally, Revelation 19, verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness, of the wrath, uh, fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So God's wrath is all through that time period. And there's a lot of liars out there. Again, the post-tribbers, they'll say, the wrath only appears halfway through. Uh, when does the mark of the beast appear? They'll say, well, at the beginning. Okay, what happens if you take the mark of the beast? You get God's wrath. <laughs> you know, and you mean read, read Revelation chapter 6 where he's opening the seals and tell me that that's not the wrath of God. The Lamb is opening the seals, sending war, famine, you know, death and hell, all this stuff, and that's not God's wrath? <laughs> Crazy. But let's uh, continue here. Romans chapter 9, verse 13. We're going to look at the man that God hated. You say, well, you said that earlier, and I don't agree. I don't think God could hate anybody. Well, let's look about what the Bible says. Romans chapter 9. Romans 9. The God that the average modern Christian worships is a God that is completely foreign to Scripture. Romans 9, verse 13. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. It does not say Esau's sin have I hated. Esau have I hated. And by the way, it says there, as it is written. That means it's in the Old Testament. Well, where do we see it in the Old Testament? I'll go back to the book of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 1. Malachi 1, verses 2 and 3. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Saith the Lord, yet I love Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. God hated Esau. Hmm. Wonder why. Genesis chapter 25. Let's see why God hated Esau. Genesis chapter 25, verse 24 through 34. It says here, And when her days uh, to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red all over like an hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. You see the birth of Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man, dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau, because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And Rebekah sawed pottage, 
excuse me, and Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink, and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Why on earth would you sell your birthright for something to eat? I mean, you know, this, this land here, the Lord gave us this land, and uh, suppose one of you came and I'm out, I'm out working here on this land, and well, I'm so hungry, and you got a thing of beans there, bank it up some baked beans or something like this. It says there, pottage of lentils. Okay, lentils being, you know, beans, bread and pottage of lentils, and you got some bread, you know, and and some beans. You're making it, and you come and you say, and I say, man, I'm hungry. Could I have some of that food? You say. Sure, just sign over the deed to this property. Let's just say that my father, you know, my dad gave it to me or something like that. And I'd be like, I don't care, whatever. Just, you know, here, sign it. Okay, give me something to eat. Are you kidding me? What a dishonor dishonorable thing to do. But that's what Esau did. It's one of the reasons why God hated him. You know what uh, your birthright is, a, is, a, is as a Christian? This King James Bible. People had to suffer and die so that you could hold this book in your hands. You back to the first century, you hold this book up, people look at it like, what is that thing? There weren't books like this back in the first century. This is a great blessing, a great benefit that we can hold our King James Bibles, Old and New Testament, in one volume. This is a bigger one. You can get little pocket Bibles and stuff like that. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. You can have a hundred copies of you know copies of the thing. I mean, you can have lots of them. That's your birthright. And yet, how many people that profess to be Christians have sold out this King James Bible and they go to the Vatican for their Bible? The very people that persecuted and put Christians to death. The very wicked, you know, fake, false church that has banned this King James Bible. They don't ban the new versions, but they'll ban this one. And I've talked to countless Catholics that tell me that when they were raised, they were told, you don't dare read the King James Bible. And yet how many people have forsaken their birthright? How many people could care less about the freedom won by Bible-believing Christians? Bible-believing Christians that petitioned for liberty of conscience. Bible-believing Christians that didn't come out and say, we want to put all Catholics to death and all Muslims to death and anybody else that disagrees with us to death. No, they just simply said, hey, liberty of conscience. We should be allowed to, to freely worship how we want to worship. As long as you're not trying to threaten other people and kill other people, you can worship your way too. Great statesmen of the past here in America fought for liberty of conscience. And yet how many people even care? They profess to be Christian and they, just, they don't care. They're the type of people that come out and says God loves sinners. They don't want to be controversial. They sell their birthright. Genesis chapter 26. Genesis 26. Verse 34 and 35. And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Bashemoth, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, which was a grief of mine unto Isaac and to Rebekah. Esau practiced integration, interracial marriage. It's recorded there. The Hittites were a, a you know, basically descendants of Ham. What are you going to do with that? Well, you know, that's the Old Testament. God's word says, Romans chapter 9, verse 13, that God hated Esau. He sold his birthright and he had an interracial marriage, two interracial marriages. And he did it when he saw that it displeased his parents. He did it on purpose. 
God hates that. Not just that, God hates the man that does it. Oh, but Brother Brian, I don't agree with you on the interracial marriage. Okay, fine. But what do you do with a verse like that? And how it ties into the Pauline epistles written for a Christian today. Why did God hate Esau? Well, God can't hate people. See how you've been lied to? Yes, God can hate people. Including written in the time, the church age time that we're currently in. The greatest time period of God's grace ever. Something to think about. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. I'll just read it here. I have it typed out. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. That was another problem that what Esau did there. Not only interracial marriage, but he also dishonored his parents. He knew it displeased him, so he did it on purpose. Just upset him. God hates a man like that. Psalm 7. Two more places to turn to and then we're done with this study. Psalm 7. Verse 11 through 13. God judges the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. If he turn not, he will wet his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. He hath also prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordaineth his arrows against the persecutors. God is angry with the wicked every day. Not God loves the sinner in their sin. God loves the sinner and hates the sin. Not true. You'll never find that in the King James Bible. You know, I can't speak for the other ones that come from the Vatican because they change them things all the time. King James Bible? Nope. Sorry, it doesn't teach it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Uh, that's what God's going to do to people who miss the rapture. That have heard the truth, that have heard the gospel, and they reject it. You see, when you come to this channel... And you watch these videos, you watch these sermons, and I've seen lost people, they'll watch sermon after sermon, they'll, they'll just, you know, hey, I agree with some of what you're saying, but you know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, that's a very dangerous thing to do. You see, what you're doing is, you're not rejecting me, you're rejecting the book. The Bible says you need to be saved. You need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. You need to come to God broken as a sinner. Have you done it? So, no, not yet. I think that God's love is for me. No, it isn't. The day that you reject Jesus Christ, the first time that you hear the gospel and you reject it, God's wrath is there for you. It's a very, very serious thing. And for you as a Christian, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Are you ashamed of the terror of the Lord? It's rough sometimes, doesn't it? Yeah, I just want to say something else about this uh, this whole thing of this uh, disaster relief stuff and whatever else, you know, and Puerto Rico has just been destroyed and they don't have power and they don't have running water and they don't have all this other stuff and things. I'm not judging everybody that lives there, but just there's another thing we need to look at here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Uh, let's see where the verse is here. Verse 10. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. For even when we were with, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. 
You know what a Christian's attitude should be towards this, all this uh, hurricane stuff and whatever else? And uh, these quote-unquote natural disasters and, and all this stuff? So funny because, you know, you have uh, this out here they call Mother Nature. And yet if it's a terrible storm and things get destroyed, they call it an act of God. Kind of funny. Loving Mother, but when things go bad, then it's God's fault. Kind of interesting how that works. But you see, as Christians, we have to keep in mind that when something bad happens to a country that's lived in wickedness and, and had all kinds of sin and things like that, um, the Bible says if any man's not working, you're not supposed to feed him. Well, if some country's judged by God, if something happens to a country that's turned their back on God and it's wicked, you don't go in there and say, hey, let me help you. Can I help you? You don't do that. But what a lot of Christians do is they fall for this modern, politically correct thing. They act just like the lost world. I'm not saying we should take joy in it. I'm not saying, ha, 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 look at those people suffering. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is we should be very quick to say, you know what? God's judgment has fallen on that country. God's judgment fell on Germany. A lot of these other countries and things, America passed the sodomite marriage thing a while back and you get the whole western coast is like on fire and burning fires everywhere out there. You get the Midwest that's got flooding and, and then droughts and all kinds of stuff. You get the southeast, you know, Florida and Georgia and other states in there. You get flooding and hurricanes hitting it and stuff, wiping all kinds of things out. Texas getting hit with, you know, what was it, Hurricane Harvey or whatever, you know. New England states and things like this get hit with bad winters and, and whatever else. Why? Because God's judgment has come to America. But the temptation, the temptation is there for you as a Christian to say, but God loves you. We can't say that as Christians. We have to be there and say, God loved you. Are you a sinner? How dare you talk to me that way? then the wrath of God be upon you. Just as simple as that. And when you get destroyed, and when things are bad for you, I'm going to tell you about the gospel. I'm not going to come and just try to patch up all your problems and say, here, I'm here to show the love of God. So that's going to be it for this study. It's one I've been wanting to redo for a while, uh, just simply to get it away from the, you know, to, to instead of just audio, to have actually a, real sermon so um, just re-recorded that one and uh, just such a challenge because it's so easy to get drawn into that as a Christian and, and get into this thing of God loves you and don't worry about it and stuff God is angry with this nation God is angry with your nation whichever nation you're in there's not any good nations left anymore okay um, they're all under God's condemnation and God's wrath and his judgment and it's only going to get worse as time goes by and we're going to have to stand up. And if it means, you know, whatever, persecution coming on the body of Christ, okay, I mean, be loving. You don't have to, to go out there and say to the sodomites all kinds of nasty names and stuff that don't appear in Scripture. No, just call them sodomites and say, God is not for sodomy. God's not for sodomite marriage. Whatever it costs you, stand by the book. Stand by the Word of God. All right? Thank you very much for watching, and we will see you in the next study.